That was In My Heart by C.J. Beards. Welcome to the Rise Weekly Review for January 24th through January 21st, 2022. On Monday, the bodies of two people were found in a parked car on the east side. 31-year-old Amanda Kahlo and her husband, 30-year-old Antonio Alvarez, were found by a witness inside a car near 110th and Avenue E around 1.30 p.m. The witness reportedly found both dead inside the car with gunshot wounds to the head. During the week, more details were released on the shooting. Alvarez, who was a three-year veteran of the Illinois State Police, had murdered his wife inside the vehicle and committed suicide. Kayla was a schoolteacher at Galisto Learning Academy on the east side. She was also known for being active in the community, including working in after-school programs, community gardens, and with the violence prevention group Safe Kids Chicago. According to relatives, she was seeking to leave her husband because of problems during the marriage. A GoFundMe has been set up for children and a couple by the daughter of the 10th Ward Alderwoman, Susan Solowski Garza. According to a Facebook post, Kalo was the Alderwoman's goddaughter. The couple leaves behind two children named Myla and Eli, ages 1 and 4 years old. Friends and family members are seeking assistance to help support Myla and Eli's education, health, and ongoing welfare. A GoFundMe can be found at the following address, bit.ly slash 3, lowercase r, lowercase d, 2, uppercase T, uppercase R, uppercase Q. A funeral mass is being held at Elmwood Chapel on 112th and Ewing between 2 and 8 p.m. In other news, a neighbor saved a woman from a house fire in South Chicago on Wednesday. According to reports, in the afternoon, a fire broke out at a home at 8343 South Saginaw. A 20-year-old woman was trapped in a building on the second floor. A neighbor of the woman, identified as Kenneth Lee, caught the woman as she jumped out of the building and assisted her. An ambulance arrived at the scene and evaluated the woman. She was released without injury. On Tuesday, an armed robbery in Calumet City led to a police chase that spanned from the south suburbs to downtown Chicago. Around 11.33 p.m., the Illinois State Police Emergency Response Network alerted local law enforcement of a vehicle fleeing the scene of an armed robbery in Calumet City. The state police air operations located the suspect traveling northbound on I-94 at East Sibley towards downtown Chicago. Two suspects were seen exiting the vehicle when troopers arrived and apprehended them. One of the suspects was captured by a state police dog. During the week, the Northwest Indiana Times reported an additional 100 people died of COVID-19 in Lake County, reaching a total of 1,580 deaths reported. Over 20,508 Hoosiers have died from COVID-19 during the pandemic, with state health records showing 2,892 were hospitalized with COVID-19 as of Friday. 31.3% of ICU beds were reportedly in use by COVID-19 patients, with 11.6% of ICU beds in the state available. The deaths come as the state seeks to end the state's declaration of a public health emergency. The Indiana State Senate approved legislation Thursday to address concerns by Governor Eric Holcomb over ending the state's COVID-19 public health emergency. The governor refused to lift the public health emergency until state lawmakers passed several provisions. The state Senate Bill 3 authorizes agency leaders to take actions to ensure Indiana continues receiving COVID-19 federal funding for health care and food assistance, permit anyone age 5 and over to voluntarily get vaccinated, and allow out-of-state health care workers to continue working in Indiana without a transfer license. These were items the governor requested before ending the public health emergency, as requested by state lawmakers. In December, the governor extended the public health emergency, which allows the governor to issue executive orders to respond to the crisis. In other Northwest Indiana news, Mayor of Hammond, Indiana, Thomas McDermott Jr. is still collecting signatures for his Senate run. McDermott is still running short with the deadline fast approaching. Under Indiana law, U.S. Senate candidates are required to collect signed petitions from 500 registered voters in each congressional district. There are nine congressional districts in Indiana, and the deadline for submission to the Indiana Election Division to qualify for the May 3rd primary election is February 4th. The current incumbent, Senator Todd Young's campaign, says it submitted 9,000 petitions earlier this month. In Chicago, a lawsuit by a group in Little Italy is calling into question the fate of the Columbus statue in South Chicago. A group calling itself the Joint Civic Committee of Italian Americans filed a lawsuit against the Chicago Park District last July, claiming that the removal of the statue in Little Italy violated a deal signed in 1973 to display the Columbus statue. Following protests in Grand Park in 2020 when activists attempted to remove the Columbus statue, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot ordered the removal of three Columbus statues. These included the one in Grand Park, one in South Chicago, and one in Little Italy. Activists claimed the statues were a monument that celebrated a man who participated in the genocide and mistreatment of indigenous people. However, some Italian Americans view the statues as an expression of their mainstream American identity. 
The lawsuit is led by business owner Ron Onesti, who owns Onesti Entertainment that operates entertainment businesses in St. Charles and Des Plaines. The lawsuit alleges the Columbus Statue Committee paid the Park District more than $10,000 in 1973 for maintaining the statue in perpetuity. The group has been pressuring Lifa to return all the statues, including naming her in the lawsuit. While the mayor had originally said the monuments would be removed pending a review that would involve community feedback, the commission has yet to provide any report or recommendations on the statues. City officials claim the committee will finish their evaluations in the first quarter of 2022. During the week, a report by WBEZ discussed the history of Chicago-area trailer parks, including plans for Harbor Point Estates in Hegwish. The report described the 1950 opening of what was originally called Island Park Trailer Court in Hegwish. The trailer court originally served school teachers, soldiers, and construction workers who worked on the Chicago Skyway at the time. Due to city ordinance that prevents the establishment of other trailer parks, it is now the only one in the city of Chicago. A Northbrook-based company called Ravina Communities that owns 5,000 mobile home lots in 10 states operates Harbor Point Estates. According to the report, Ravina Communities is planning to add 150 new homes to vacant land on the property. The report states that 1,200 square foot homes are being developed that will run around $90,000 each. A report from WTTW discussed plans by the Army Corps of Engineers to study the city's eroding shoreline. The study, funded by $3 million from the City of Chicago and the federal government, will look at evaluating the shoreline to produce what is called the Chicago Shoreline General Evaluation Report. According to the Army Corps, the focus of the study will be on examining the storm damage protection to Lake Michigan and Lakeshore Drive due to shoreline deterioration. The project aims to look at developing protections from Montrose Beach on the north side to the south water purification plant near Rainbow Beach and South Shore. No current consideration is being given for deterioration near Calumet Park. Costs for the study will be split with the Chicago CDOT and Park District funding $1.5 million and the federal government providing $1.5 million from the Federal Infrastructure and Jobs Act. The Army Corps is also receiving millions of dollars for construction projects that will include work on the T.J. O'Brien locks near Big Marsh between South Deering and Hegwish. According to the Army Corps reports, the Corps initially requested $52 million to physically complete and close out work on rehabilitating the lock and dam located on the Calumet River. The Corps, however, is receiving $57.4 million that is to include work on not only the O'Brien locks but several other projects as well. It is unclear from the current reports what the extent of the work includes. However, within the past year, the Corps has been addressing questions by activists about additional river dredging and storage on the Calumet Disposal Facility, or CDF. And finally, those seeking to attend the Chicago Auto Show in February will find extended services on the South Shore Line. The South Shore will be offering extra Saturday train services nonstop from McCormick Place to Hegwish and then make all local stops terminating at Carroll Avenue in Michigan City running eastbound. The Saturday service will run February 12th and February 19th and will depart McCormick Place at 4.52 p.m. Additional trains will make flex stops at McCormick Place between February 14th to the 18th and February 21st. Please note, mask requirements remain in effect through February 18th. More information can be found by visiting mysouthshoreline.com and clicking on the news link. And that ends our weekly review for January 24th through January 21st, 2022. Thank you for joining us for this week in review. Peace. <laughs>